How's it going, everybody? Welcome back to the Jesse Nyberg podcast. Today, run another solo episode, number three, I believe. Um, I like doing these. They're a little bit of a different kind of change of pace, but it's nice to post something that is, it's kind of like a video, except without quite as much B-roll and editing and, and time intensive. And it's also something I can put on the audio for the people that listen to audio. By the way, if you do listen to the audio podcast on Apple uh, podcast and you want to review it, that'd be cool. If not, all good also. One of the first things... Um, I wanted to talk about was, so we've all kind of seen the, I call it the curse of minimalism. I actually want to create a full video on it sometime in the, in the near future. But you know, basically all these companies from tech companies to sports companies to, you know, even in like some uh, extreme sports, like high energy world gaming, where you think they wouldn't do this, they are rebranding to a simpler um, logo, but not better. I think that there was such an influx of minimalism and good minimalist logos, especially back in like the logo, like modernism, like perfect logo days from like the sixties and seventies and stuff that people think that you need to simplify it to make it better. However, they are only stripping away the character without adding anything valuable. Like it's not taking away the right elements. So like we, I've seen the Rams do it, LA Rams originally in terms of the sports world. And that one, it's grown on me a little bit, but overall I just don't like it, but I could have lived with that. Cause I don't really care about the Rams, but then my team, the Philadelphia Eagles recently, I wrote about this in my newsletter, rebranded to a shitty logo type. The Eagles have one of the coolest logos, I think, in the NFL. It's this awesome bird. And then they have this super cool type. I'll throw a picture up where it's sharp on the edge and it fits perfectly in like a kind of rounded, you know, arched way. And they changed it to like some shitty sans serif with like a little, they try to add like these stupid little triangles, I guess, to make it still feel like it has like energy or something. But Overall, it looks bad, and now the lo the logo, actual um, the actual like eagle, looks bad with the new word mark. So if they were gonna do it, they might as well just ruin all of it, because now it's like they kept a little bit of the coolness, but it mostly looks bad. So, and the reason I'm talking about this isn't just because oh, I love the eagles and I'm mad that they changed the thing, but I think as designers, we have a kind of a responsibility, and I'm sure all of these are done by like big agencies and stuff. So that's its own problem that you can't really fix on this micro level. But I think we have a responsibility to like not make things shittier just in the term of minimalism and like maybe combat the client a little bit more and pitch ideas or leave the, leave it the way it is. Like, um, yeah, it's good to get paid and it's good to take on these cool projects. And I'm sure it'd be really hard to turn down, you know, working with an NFL team or a giant brand, but you know, these things are cool and it sucks when they get ruined. You know, I mean, we've all seen the worst example of all, which I think is happened about a year ago, probably more now is the Petco logo. And they kind of half ass saved it by saying, we're not getting rid of the little dog and the little cat. And they use it in like kind of all branding elements and like here and there on the website, but they had one of the coolest logos, like the blue and red dog. And it was super fun. And Petco felt like this, it, it fit the brand. It was fun, good vibes. And now it's so, so sterile and like clinical medical. Those are like, it, it looks like a shitty online subscription based prescription company. Everything doesn't have to be professional. I mean, like the, some of the worst examples too that you see this happen in is the in the fashion industry. So like um, Balmain, Saint Laurent, those kind of brands, they have these beautiful like serif script writing, and they all switch to like a geometric kind of sans serif or like a grotesque more rather sans serif. Once these trends die, I feel like all these brands are going to be stuck looking the same, and they're not going to have kept any of their originality. And the ones that do will come out on top. So I think it's important to, you know, keep the character that you have because it's one of the one things that helps you stand out in the, this world where it's really hard to grab people's attention. 
All right, let's look through some of my notes. I asked uh, people to submit some either questions or topics, and I also wrote some down myself. Someone asked me about some other resources to learn online, and just off the top of my head, I would say for design specifically, like software stuff, Dread Labs makes some cool tutorials. Um, Spoon Graphics, I think it's called also on YouTube. They're pretty cool. And then I really liked Aaron Draplin's uh, courses on Skillshare. You can sign up for probably a free trial or something. Um, maybe I'll plug them more if they give me a sponsor. So we'll see. But, uh, also just books, 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 not necessarily as much about software, but it does help with the fundamentals and just overall like learning more about design theory and thinking and color and things like that. If you want to check out some books, I have all that stuff linked in the description and I have obviously few videos that I made on them that you can check out. And I also just like keeping, this isn't really about like learning specifically, but I like keeping up with what's going on. So I like reading a lot of the articles in It's Nice That, um, and AIGA Ion Design. Sometimes they're mid, but a lot of times they're really good and they, they like go into the nuance of things or things like political about design. And it's pretty interesting. And a lot of the writers that work for those companies are really cool and, and they're good. And they also do a lot good job, especially it's nice that of featuring designers, big or small, that have cool styles and putting people on and it's really cool. Lately, people have been asking me about things like how do you get clients or how do you, you know, what do you do to like get more into freelancing or get more into the design world? And I always want to say that you kind of just have to make stuff until you have clients. And it sucks because that can feel like sometimes you don't know what to do, but if you really love design and art, you will, you'll be able to kind of figure it out and create personal stuff and create prompts for yourself and just have fun with it. But also do the stuff you want to be making, right? Um, sometimes people complain about, oh, I don't get enough logo projects or album art or, you know, website design and it's because you need to you need the social proof like you need to prove to these people that you know how to do that so if you're really interested in let's say music stuff and you want to create tour posters create a bunch of music posters and post them online instagram twitter whatever and show that you know how to do it and just do it for fun and that if you're a good designer and those designs are dope and especially if you get the attention of the artists and tag people I know tons of people who have done stuff like that and it's worked and they've built a full career out of it um, someone I can think of just specifically is Emma Burr's Burr's Letters she creates these really cool um, typographic posters hand-drawn type and she used to do just for bands always just different albums just for fun and now seems like every other time she posts something it's in, for the actual band so like that's just perfect proof that you just make the stuff you want to be doing especially if even if it's just for fun and then you can probably work your way up to actually doing that stuff for those people because you need to it's hard for people to want to take risks people already have a hard enough time paying for design work in it with a respectable price and knowing how to talk to designers and whatnot, but if they don't know how to, if they don't know you can do something, it's going to be hard for you to prove that you can pay them or sorry, prove that you can do the work. So yeah, just make what you want to be doing. Same with your portfolio, put the work in it that you want to get. And if you have like, you know, burnout or you don't have ideas and you or creative block and it's, I know that can happen. And for me, I feel like it, happens it would just by not starting starting usually helps but what i do is you know write carry around a notebook you can field notes like this or whatever shout out aaron draplin your notes app your computer probably something not your computer something you carry around because anytime you have an idea whether it be like a, a sh some kind of layout you think you're thinking of in your head you see something that inspires you take a picture of it you um have an idea for like a phrase you want to incorporate in like a poster or album or just write all that stuff down because once you get to the actual back into the actual lab and you're like designing something and you want to make something it's a lot easier to um 
create like when you already have an, a rough idea in place or you already have like these ideas in your notes app. I recently read this book called Rest and one of the things that they're big on is stopping and by that they mean stopping at a place that you already have something to get back into or an idea already in place because it's a lot easier to hop back into an idea or when you're halfway through a piece of work or you already kind of have a something figured out and starting completely from scratch. So I think that's why a lot of people think that they suffer with creative block or burnout and things is because you're trying to do all the steps built into one thing when you just want to be able to get into it. So it's good to do the kind of concepting in your subconscious mind and when you're idling and throughout different days, that way when you actually want to create something for fun or create some art or design, kind of have a base to go off of or you have drafts like don't be afraid to stop at a good point when you're working on something think go out and think about it come back and it'll be easier when you come back to it and like I said sometimes getting started is all that it takes I I've noticed that I feel like I suffer from creative block but it's mostly more of maybe procrastination or just the lack of starting when I'm actually in the zone and in that flow state it's hard for me to like get stopped or blocked or run out of ideas. It's mostly the act of actually starting and actually, you know, getting going and getting it moving. But, you know, it's all momentum. I feel like, uh, what is it? Phil Nice, I think it was, he taught me on the inertia type thing where it's um, an object in motion will stay in motion, you know? So it's a similar vibe for, for working. I don't know if I got that science right, but <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, once you build that momentum, I think that works out. And I think that doesn't only work out on the micro scale like that when it comes to like a specific task or project or day, but on the bigger picture, I think that's why people are able to do these 365 a day design challenges or work on client work all the time without getting burnt out or whatever it may be, because it's easy to feel like that stuff's hard to keep up to when you don't build the habit and the momentum. So like they say it takes 21 days to build a habit, but after that point, it just becomes kind of second nature. And it's a lot easier to get back into it each time and just do that thing. Like I try to create something every day or at least every other day. And the longer you put stuff off and the longer you go between creating stuff or designing or working on a thing that you need, that you want to work on for a long period of time, the harder it is each time to get into that session. If you build that habit, and that kind of, you know, ritual, it's a lot easier. So even though I'm, you know, kind of advocating for having a routine and working and being consistent, you need to also, I think, a way to do this, because this might sound like a quick way to get burnout, right? But a way to do this is do it in a efficient and long-term sustainable way overworking yourself on a daily basis may seem like you're invincible, especially when you get in that momentum, but over a long period of time, it can definitely cause you to burn out. And I've experienced that myself. And especially in the, probably the past month or so, actually, I was experiencing that quite a bit. But one of the things that I think helps with that is that you need to take breaks for your subconscious mind to reflect and help you with what you're working on. So I'm going back to this book that I read again, rest, cause I, I highly recommend it. It was super helpful, but we, you know, you ever see, think about when people have like these like eureka moments and like, Oh, I thought of that idea. Like I finally solved it. And it's when they stopped working and it's not that you, you need that work to get to that point. But the act of stopping and slowing down and not getting so in the weeds of what you're working on is what helps you come up with the idea to solve that problem. So for me, I try to work like only a specific amount of time each day. That way there's time for me to reflect and think about the stuff. And like once you're stopping, not just like manically getting back into the work and actually giving yourself, you know, that time to rest. Honestly, like we, we live in a world that romanticizes like overworking and constantly being on the edge of burnout and working eight, 12 hour days, especially out here in LA New York and like Hollywood, all that, like this high energy spots, like 
it's becomes the norm to like people brag about how they don't sleep, you know, or how much they work and your whole thing shouldn't be about just working it. It's not, it's really not sustainable. And especially when you have the privilege as a freelancer or something to control your own hours. I know it's easier said than done when you have a boss that makes you work these hours or someone making you stay these long things and work late. But when it's up to you, you have to have the respect for your future self and like your mental health to put aside some of that time to rest. And it really does work. Like I was recently working on this logo project and I was kind of at a, at a stop in the project where it was hard for me to figure out where I wanted to go next with this specific like direction on a piece of the branding. And I just stopped working for the day and I started reading and I started just watching, uh, I think I was watching the boys or better call saw one of those shows. And I started, I got these like random ideas that helped me solve that project and I wrote them down in my notes and I didn't like act on it right then. I came to it the next day and it was a lot easier, like I was saying, to hop into it already having that kind of excitement and something to look forward to without, you know, overworking myself for the day. But I wasn't doing anything like I was watching TV, you know, I, I, and it's like, cause your mind's still working, you know, on the thing in the back and Sometimes you need that different thought process besides being like specifically on it to help you, you know, solve these things. And basically like not working on something sometimes is what gets the job done. As ironic as it is, it turns out to be true. Some other things I feel like that kind of help me work on this idea of sustainability and like keeping a, my workflow consistent and also my mental health okay and just... Jeez, those things, sorry, I'm adjusting this mic. Um, the three things I, I always, I wrote them down that I think are important to me and were reinforced in some reading I've been doing is morning ritual, number one, routine, ritual, whatever you want to call it. Number two, going for walks. And number three, the four hours of deep work. So let's start with the four hour, or let's start with the morning ritual. We'll go in order. This is important because like I said, building a habit and building, setting yourself up for success, you know, having the environment that best works for you. And now this morning ritual may sound terrible to some people and good to others. Everyone's different. I'm not saying you need to do it this way. You need to figure out your own, um, your own ritual, your own routine. So I wake up at nine usually, which isn't terribly early but also not late enough to make me feel bad and I will get by 10 today but usually wake up at nine I do don't do the phone right away that's bad when I do do that probably 20 percent of the time I waste time for like 30 minutes looking at social media and stuff so I don't want to start like that I try my best not to what I do is um brush my teeth protein shake coffee the reason I do it that simple way each time, same uh, it's pour over coffee, same protein shake or protein bar and doing the brushing the teeth and the bathroom morning part. The reason I like it simple like that is because I want the least path, least resistance on my path from getting up to getting what I want to do for that day done. And that kind of that core task will go into the four hours thing that I want to talk about, but I don't like making big breakfasts, working out, doing anything in the morning that's going to either take away or distract me from the clearest path to waking up, getting the creative work I want to do done. And that's pretty much, you know, the routine. And then this goes into the four hours of deep work. So I'm not saying I only work four hours always, but that's the minimum slash maximum sometimes requirement that I try to set for myself because after that you can't do much like creative deep work. So I try to do the most important stuff right away. So from 10 to two is when I do my deep creative work, uh, design work, um, client work personal design work, client work, anything that takes a lot of creative energy, recording a video, sometimes a podcast, uh, editing, get into that because 
that's when I can just get in that flow state and go really hard. And by the time it's like one or two, you know, I'm hungry. Uh, I want to kind of eat lunch. And then after you eat lunch, you know, it kind of all goes downhill from there, especially if you eat a lot of carbs and stuff. And I'm not, I still work till about five or six usually sometimes later, but after that first big deep work session, I kind of just do like more admin managerial stuff, like upload videos, write, write, um, write do thumbnails, like simple editing, uh, write, like write stuff, like more, um, scheduling things that aren't as creative and like heavy, heavy thought and deep in it. And that usually works because you want to do the hardest thing first. So like the, I've talked about this before, but I make sure I have my daily highlight or my core task. Let's say it's uh, record this podcast. Let's say that's the most important thing for today. From that 10 to two period, I make sure to get that done. And then whatever else I need to do is just bonus. If I get it done, it's good to have a to-do list, but make sure you have one that, or like, I like to have one that needs to be done. That way you're fulfilled if you get it done. And if you do any other stuff, it's kind of bonus and just makes you feel better. But if you don't, you don't feel bad. Like it was like a requirement. That's what works for me though. Some people like to rise slow, do all this other stuff and do a lot of their creative work later in the day. And you know, that's cool too. So something I heard recently, I wish I could remember where it was and I want to make like a more in-depth video about it and create some kind of narrative around this idea. I forgot where I heard it. So I'm sorry, whoever I should be giving credit to, but or this is the pref to preface this. It's easy to get caught up in this idea of always wanting to worry about getting paid. And that is important, but it's not the only value you can get out of a project or job. So they basically said a job or project should satisfy these three things. There's three things that it can satisfy and two of them it needs. If it has two out of the three, it's probably a worthwhile thing because sometimes money isn't, isn't the thing that is making that job worth it. So there's getting paid well, making connections. And then thirdly is learning. So learning valuable stuff from this experience. So if something pays well and you're going to learn from it, no brainer. If something pays well and it's, uh, you'll make a connection. Cool. Maybe you don't learn. Maybe it's something you already know how to do, but you get to work with someone cool or uh, work with a different designer, photographer, whatever. But this is where it comes in. It doesn't always have to even just pay well if you have the time for it and the resources. If it's something you can learn from and meet people, there's a world where that is still a valuable experience. Yeah, you need to get the money, but if you can get the money in other ways, it frees you up for doing fun, fulfilling projects like that. Because it sometimes the coolest stuff, unfortunately, isn't going to pay well. But if it does um, learn and you meet cool people, there's value in that. And I'm not saying it's guaranteed, but it can lead to other stuff down the way. And I'm someone, don't get me wrong, that gets caught up in always trying to get paid the maximum amount. And, you know, because we're so disrespected in other ways that I think I've overcompensated in terms of like pricing and worrying about money. But that really like gave me some perspective on like, yeah, it isn't, there is other things that can come from it. And you need to have the money, obviously, but if you're already handled for that month or that quarter or whatever you do your budgeting off of, I think it is a good idea to take on that stuff and, you know, feed your soul, not just your bank account and learn and meet people that are cool and do cool shit. Someone else wanted to ask me, how do you work under pressure while still staying calm and creative? So when I'm working under pressure on a tight deadline, I don't know if I stay calm. That's not really, a, I don't know if I have a recommendation for that, but a way to stay creative when you're, you know, maybe overworked or having to do stuff on tight deadlines is respect yourself firstly and try to keep that routine that you have that I was talking about or keep the same way you're working and don't let people force you into doing things that are going to be bad for like you in the long term. If you need to get something done, we've all been there. You're scrambling late at night, whatever. Respect yourself too. respect the client and get stuff done. But when you're under pressure, it's still important to slow things down and make sure that you're doing everything correctly. Because I don't think sometimes people understand that 
yeah, like if you need to get something done late at night and you might think, well, I'll just work on this like for eight hours, like all the way through the night, but waiting, getting that rest and what we were talking about earlier with like your subconscious mind and allowing your brain to reset and coming back into it might turn that eight hours of long night of work into two or three hours in the morning because you had time to replenish, you know? I know it's easier said than done. You can't always, you know, choose how the schedule works. This is why I didn't like working as an employee. And I'm not against it. I would still love to work probably at like a studio someday if, if I'm feeling like working with a collective or whatever. But you can't, you're not set up for success. Everyone works at a different speed, rate, hours, budget, whatever. So like expecting everyone to be on the same nine to five thing and work late, everyone work late, everyone come in earlier, whatever it is, it's not going to work. And that's why I think a lot of people don't want to work for, want to work for themselves and leave their jobs, especially when COVID made them realize that because when you're forced to perform in an environment that doesn't set you up for success, it's really hard to ever break through. And you can be, people may look at it like you're not trying or, you know, you're not a good worker and it's, it's just like school. It's set up differently. It doesn't work for everyone. Everyone has a different way of learning, working, and a different path to success, you know? One thing I've been doing, I went to grab it real quick. I posted like a, I think a reel or TikTok of it, but switching topics. One thing I've been doing is saving my work in a folder like this. Not all my work, not like client work or portfolio work, but if you're watching the video, you can see it says posters 2021. And you know, everything's stuck in the, in the internet everything's on Instagram and I have all this work that I've created just for fun. And like, you know, once it's out of like maybe the last 18, 21 posts of three kind of forget it. Like it, it's forgettable and people don't even go to look at it or you almost forget it even happened. But I've been trying to save like some of my favorite uh, Instagram posts that are like, or posters rather that are, um, you know, just in this folder, right? It's six, uh, eight by 10, cause I had design in 16 by 20. So I just scale it down and I can save stuff in here. And I feel like it'll be cool to look back on. And it's cool to see like the different stuff you've worked on and the styles and not just let it live and die on Instagram, you know? Trying to show it in the shop, but this is a good idea. and. I just print these through Costco and you can watch my how to do prints video to like learn more about that. But I think it's going to be cool. And like, I really, I feel like romanticize like big collections of things and like organizing and having like being old and having all this stuff to look at. So like, that's why I wrote on the side here is because I want to do this every year or multiple a year, however fast I fill it up. And I think of someone like Roy Cranston or Ram um, Overset Tax who have done a 365 challenge. And it's like, how cool would that be if they had the 365 posters all physical? And it, it sounds expensive, but it's really not. It's like a, a little bit over a dollar probably to print each one on nice quality paper and buying this folder was super cheap too. I think 10 bucks or something. So that's something I've been doing and I recommend it. It's nice to look at something in the physical world, take it away from digital. If you are going to do that, I recommend setting up your files that you design in as eight by 10 or 16 by 20. But other than that, you know, I just want to say take care of yourself, you know, don't stress yourself out too much. Your mental should come first. And I forget that all the time. So I don't want others to. If you like this podcast and want to support it, you can check out the Patreon. And I'm also doing a bonus episode that I'm dropping on there for a kind of extended version of this one. So it helps support, throw a couple of bucks a month, helps me run the channel, make things better, give me a little safety net, as well as you get some more shit. There's bonus podcast episodes, there's um, source files from my projects, there's high res stuff, wallpapers, um, textures, and behind the scenes stuff that I throw up on there. And the cheapest one's like $3, so that's less than than a cup of coffee with all the inflation and shit. But check that out, link in the description. And thank you for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Peace.